Hi, welcome back. It is so nice to have you here. Thank you so much for being here and for wanting to spend some of your time with me. I really do appreciate it. So today I am talking about everything I read in September. I read a lot this summer and I thought that my reading pace would slow down in September maybe. I wasn't worried about that because, you know, for me it is always quality over quantity. So as long as I read great books, I don't really care about how many books I read or how fast I read them, okay? But you know, I must say that September was great in both respects because I read a lot of great books. So there was quality and there was quantity. So I read a total of 13 novels in September. I only read Italian and French literature, but all the books I read are widely available in English translation. And in fact, I am going to link to all of them in the description box below. So you can have a look and buy any of them if you want to read them. Now, only three of the novels I read were written by women, but there was a mix between recent books and modern classics. And I did not read anything that was written before the 20th century. Okay, so let's get started with my September wrap up. Now, if you watched my summer wrap-up video, you would know that I read some novels by Umberto Eco this summer. I read probably his most famous two novels, The Name of the Rose and Foucault's Pendulum, uh, Pendulum in the summer. So I decided to start September with a novel by Umberto Eco that I didn't have time to read in August. Baudolino was first published in 2000. I read it in Spanish translation, but the English translation is by William Weaver and I am going to link to both the Italian and the English editions in the description box below by the way. I enjoyed Umberto Eco's other novels a lot but Baudolino left me feeling a little bit perplexed. It is a difficult novel to discuss and I'm not even sure I ever got a handle on it but let me tell you what I can about it, okay? So Baudolino is set during the sack of Constantinople in 1204. And you might remember from history class that Constantinople was the capital of the Byzantine Empire, which was actually the Eastern Roman Empire or what was left of the Roman Empire after the fall of the Western part. Anyway, Constantinople is present day Istanbul, which is now the main city in Turkey, of course, although not uh, its capital. Okay, going back to this novel, we are in medieval Europe in the time of the Crusades. The novel's main character and narrator is Baudolino of Alexandria, who tells the story of his life and the many adventures he goes through to a man named Niketas uh, Coniatis, I think. Baudolino was born into a poor Italian family in Italy, but he claims that he was sold and then adopted uh, sold to and then adopted to the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick I. The problem is that Baudolino is a liar, so how much of what he says is true? Baudolino, who speaks many languages, is a master of fantasy and invention, so that's what you can expect from this novel, a mixture of medieval history, myth and fantasy. There are monsters, there is magic, there is sex, there is death, there is also a lot of humour in this novel, but mostly there are details, so many details about theological discussions about the Holy Trinity, about the Virgin Mary. Baudolino, the novel, is a feast of imagination and erudition, exactly the kind of thing that fans of Umberto Eco, I think, would expect from his books. But I don't think that Baudolino quite works as a novel completely, not like the other novels by him I have read anyway. That is not to say that I didn't enjoy it. I had a good time reading Baudolino, mostly because of the humor. But if you have never read anything by Umberto Eco, I don't recommend Baudolino as your first foray into his writing. Instead, I would say go with either um, The Name of the Rose or Foucault's Pendulum, really. But if you have already read and enjoyed other novels by Umberto Eco, I think you will also enjoy Baudolino. And if you have read Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities um, and enjoyed it, I think you will like digging into Baudolino as well. And that is a great segue to the next few books I'm going to talk about because they are all by Italo Calvino. So in September I started reading the famous trilogy Our Ancestors. I read the first two novels of the trilogy last month, but it is not the kind of trilogy you must read in order because each of the novels has a self-conclusive story and uh, the stories are not related in any way to each other. So 
anyway, nonetheless, you know, I decided to start with the first uh, book in the series, which is The Cloven Viscount, and I was a bit baffled by it because it almost read like a children's book or what I think of a children's book because I haven't read uh, books for children since I was a child, really. But I had a lot of fun reading it. Uh, the Cloven Viscount, or in Italian, Il Visconte di Mezzato, is a fantasy novel or novella, um, almost just a short story, really. It tells the story of a 17th century Italian nobleman, the Viscount Medardo of Terralba, who suffers a war injury when he's fighting against the Turkish army. And here comes the big fantasy element of the novel. The Viscount gets hit by a cannonball and split into two, but he survives. But there are now two of him, or rather two halves of him. So one half is mean and the other one is kind. The Cobb Viscount, I guess, deals with human duality, which is a theme often explored in literature. Um, the most famous example of this that comes to mind is probably Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which I discussed last week um, in my video about great Victorian novels. But Calvino's approach to this theme is totally different. For one thing, The Cloven Viscount is not a horror story like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Also, you know, Italo Calvino was interested in Italian folktales, and The Cloven Viscount reads exactly like a folktale, uh, which, which is why when I started reading it, I wrongly thought that it was a children's book. It is not a book for children, or at least not just for children. The next novel in the Our Ancestors trilogy is The Baron in the Trees, or in Italian, Il Barone Rampante, which is a longer, deeper, more philosophical work, I think. Again, at the center of the story, we have an Italian nobleman, in this case, a baron, Cosimo Piovasco di Rondò, who from a young age chooses self-determination for himself. So one day, when he's still very young, he decides that he's gonna go live on top of trees for the rest of his life. The Baron in the Trees is a fascinating novel, but it did drag a little bit for me. I enjoyed the early chapters a lot more than the rest of the novel. Uh, the story takes place in the 18th century, and it begins when uh, Cosimo is 12. On the very day, he chooses to leave the family home and climb up a tree on their estate. The catalyst for Cosimo's decision is his refusal to eat a meal, a snail soup, that his sister had prepared for the family. The Baron in the Trees tells the life story of Cosimo from that very day on. Cosimo's story, however, is told by his younger brother, uh, Biagio. Cosimo will keep his promise and spend the rest of his life uh, living on top of trees, but he will still manage to become a brilliant intellectual. So this novel is an ode to individual freedom, at least to the individual freedom of intellectuals, I think. Cosimo also belongs to a race of imaginative literary heroes like Don Quixote, so yes, I would recommend The Baron in the Trees to everyone. Also, you know, Italo Calvino is one of those few authors that fascinate me, so much so that I think I would like to read everything he ever wrote at some point. And that is why I went back and uh, read his first novel, The Path to the Nest of Spiders, or in Italian, Il Sentiero dei Nidi di Ragno. This novel has nothing to do with Italo Calvino's later better known fiction or with uh, Our Ancestors trilogy because there is no fantasy in it. The Path of the Nest of Spiders is a straightforward narrative. It's the story of Pin, an orphaned boy living in a small coastal town in Italy during World War II. That almost sounds like an updated version of Great Expectations by Charles Dickens set in Italy, but the similarities stop there. Pin's sister is a prostitute, and one day Pin steals a gun from one of her customers, a German soldier, and he hides it somewhere in the path of the spider's nest, hence the title. Pin hangs out with men who are older than him, many of which are members of the Italian resistance movement, which Italo Calvino was also involved in. And that is all there is about this novel. As I said, it is very straightforward and unlike anything else I have read by Italo Calvino so far. It was his first novel, and as a first novel, it's not bad, but I wouldn't have read it if it wasn't for my mission to read all Italo Calvino's books at some point. I read two more novels by him in September, which are a lot more interesting than The Path of the Nest of Spiders. I also read uh, The Castle of Cross Destinies, or in Italian, Il Castello dei Destini Incrociati, which is probably the most maddening work of fiction that I have read in a long time. I mean, the whole concept of the novel 
is fascinating. But the reading experience, the actual reading experience I had was so confusing and frustrating. Um, let me just tell you about it and you'll know what I mean, I think. So the narrative in the Castle of Cross Destinies is built on tarot cards. We have a group of travelers, but for some reason they cannot speak. So they tell their stories through tarot cards. Now that sounds so original, but it is actually very hard to know what you read in. Um, the novel is extremely short, which can be, and in this case is misleading, because a slim novel is not always easier to read than a big one. And I have spoken about that in a video that I'm going to link somewhere up here if, in case you're interested um, in that top on that topic. But I hadn't read uh, this maddening, confusing novel when I made that video, otherwise I would have included it as an example of an extremely short, yet extremely difficult novel to read. But, you know, I would love to hear from any fans of The Castle of Cross Destinies because I would actually be willing to read it again if someone could illuminate how this novel is meant to be read or how they have read it and got anything out of it. Okay, I was more successful in my rereading of Italo Calvino's If on a Winter's Night at Traveller or in Italian Se una notte d'inverno un viaggiatore, which is probably the most famous novel by Italo Calvino or by any other Italian writer, I think. If On a Winter's Night a Traveller was also the first novel by Calvino I read many, many years ago. I loved that first reading experience, but with the passing of time I had forgotten much of the novel, so since I was already on Calvino, I decided to read it again. And I do not regret it. If On a Winter's Night a Traveller is a novel about the reading experience of fiction. It is not a conventional novel, although it offers many of the pleasures of reading novels. It is a novel that explores the experience of reading a novel. Okay, so it's a novel about reading novels. If On a Winter's Night a Traveller also has a beautiful structure. There are 22 chapters, each divided into two sections. In the first section of each chapter, there is a character who is a reader who is trying to find the next chapter of the novel they are reading, which is Italo Calvino's latest novel entitled Even a Winter's Night a Traveller, which is not the novel that we are reading, although they share the same title and the same author. Now, that might sound confusing, but if you read the novel, it is not really confusing when you read it. Now, then the second section in each chapter is the actual chapter of the novel that the character reader is reading. Only that, playfully, there is more than one novel because of, uh, you know, there are misprints and other errors. The reader within the novel is not reading the same novel, but instead they start, always start in several different equally compelling novels all the time. So if you're game for this kind of thing and want to explore why we read, why we enjoy reading fiction, what keeps us reading fiction and so on, If on a Winter's Travel, uh, Night a Traveller is the best novel about that that I have ever read. But if you want a straightforward story, a linear narrative with a beginning, a middle and an end, then you should really pick up something else. I love reading all these novels by Italo Calvino in September and as I said I want to read more of his writing and perhaps one day even manage to read everything he ever wrote, but I think I'm going to take a break for a while now and read other authors. And one of the books I wanted to read this year because I felt like I should have already read it is Journey to the End of the Night or in French Voyage au bout de la nuit from 1932 by the French writer Louis Ferdinand Céline. Now, I wanted to read Journey to the End of the Night in French, I really did, but because the author uses a lot of slang, I had to read it in translation. I regret choosing a Spanish translation because the slang the narrator chose to use kind of took me out of the story at times, but you know, at least I could understand it, which is the main thing. Journey to the End of the Night is meant to be to a large extent, an autobiographical novel, which is why the protagonist is named Ferdinand, like the author, and works as a medical doctor, which was also Céline's profession. Journey to the End of the Night begins when Ferdinand is still a medical student. He enrolls in the French army to fight in World War I. He then works out very quickly that war does not make any sense. That initial disappointment sets the tone for the rest of the novel, which is one of the most pessimistic works of fiction I have ever read. If you're interested in war narratives, particularly World War I narratives, or want to read something that reflects on, on a 20th century pessimistic worldview, Journey to the End of the Night 
is a great novel. I wish I could read it in French and I'm sure I could if I devoted some extra time to learn all the slang that Celine very deftly, no doubt, deployed in his story. Another great French novel I read in September was Life, a User's Manual, or in French La Vie Mode d'Emploi by Georges Perec. Life, a User's Manual was first published in 1978, but a lot of it takes place sooner. So the most interesting thing about this novel, I think, is its structure. Here's the best way I could explain it, okay? So picture one of those big apartment buildings in Paris. Even if you have never been to Paris, most people have seen those buildings in movies or on television. Okay, so imagine one such building or block of flats. Now remove the facade so you can look at it as you would a, hu a huge doll's house. Then you're free to zoom in on any of the rooms in any of the apartments and see what the building's inhabitants are up to. But not just right now, not just the current tenants, but also all the previous ones in the past. What do you think you would find out? How many secrets do you think are held within those walls? That is the structure of a life a user's of life a user's manual and what you will get from reading it, put in the simplest terms. But the novel is also a puzzle. It is a puzzle that the reader must put together as they read. Um, if you have read and enjoyed Hopscotch by Julio Cortázar, which is another puzzle set in Paris, then you might also enjoy Life a User's Manual. Another novel uh, it has been likened to is The Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov. That is to say that Life a User's Manual is not for the faint of heart. It's probably a love it or hate it kind of novel and it's also probably a novel worth rereading from time to time. I feel like my first reading of it, which um, you know was in September, was very superficial and if I read it again very slowly and closely, perhaps making more notes, I will probably get a lot more out of it. But I must say, you know, that even though I finish Life a User's Manual in September, on my, uh, on my defense, it took me most of the summer to read it. I did read it slowly and paying close attention, okay? I just feel like reading it once, just once, is probably not enough to get everything this novel has to offer. Uh, Life a User's Manual is so expansive. There are so many lists in the novel. There is also an appendix. So I wish I could find a good hardback edition in French, but I've only been able to uh, find so far those cheap marketplace paperbacks that are so popular in France. Life a User's Manual is for fans of the likes of Italo Calvino or Paul Auster, but if you do not consider yourself one, one of those, uh, a fan of one of those writers, you might be relieved to hear me talk about a much simpler yet beautiful novel. I am referring to Bonjour Tristesse, which was the first novel by the French writer Françoise Sagan. This novel was first published in 1954. Uh, but I think it has aged uh, very well. I read it once before many, many years ago, but I had forgotten, totally forgotten the plot, so I read it again last month. The protagonist of Bonjour Tristesse is a teenage girl named Cécile. She's 17 years old and is spending the summer holidays with her widowed father, Raymond, and his lover, Elsa. That summer, Cécile begins dating a local boy named Cyril. One day, the three of them are joined by a woman named Anne, who was a close friend of Cécile's late mother. Anne's arrival signals the end of that peaceful va balance between the father, the lover, and the daughter. Of course, I'm not going to tell you why or how or what happens, but what I think is remarkable is that the author of Bonjour Tristesse, François Sagan, was only 19 when she wrote this great, great novel. Bonjour Tristesse, I think now, could be classed as YA, but that label, that label didn't exist in the 1950s. I think it's a novel that adults would also enjoy. I certainly did. It is a story of jealousy and manipulation that ends in tragedy, or does it? I'm sure some readers would find Cécile and her father Raymond insufferable, but I think Bonjour Tristesse is a compelling little novel that might just make a bigger impact on you than you would think. So let's stay in France for a moment, but talk about a completely different novel. Zazie in the Metro, or in French, uh, Zazie dans le Métro, uh, has a child, a little girl, as its protagonist. But it is most certainly not suitable for children. 
I was not so much shocked, but amused that my local library, uh, my local public library, uh, classes this novel as children's lit. I don't know why they do that. But at first, that almost put me off reading it. But since it was such a famous novel, I decided to give it a chance anyway. And almost as soon as I started reading it, I realized that Zazie in the Metro is not for children. For one thing, there is a lot of obscene language in this novel, which I found amusing personally, but I don't think most parents of young children would like their offspring to come across that kind of language in print. Uh, Zazie in the Metro is a 1959 novel by the French writer Raymond Queneau. Zazie, the main character, is a precocious girl, not yet a teenager. She's from the French provinces, but she spends a few days in Paris um, and she's looked after by her uncle Gabriel. Zazie wants to ride the Paris Metro, but there happens to be a strike, so the Metro is shut down. The novel takes place during Zazie's visit to Paris and narrates her adventures in the big city. I think that language and style are the best things about this novel. Keno for sure experimented with the French language a lot in this novel, and if you speak uh, French or have studied it, you would know that one of the main difficulties in learning French is the difference between spoken and written French. And I think that there is a clear attempt here at shortening the gap between spoken and written French uh, in this novel, which is why I would recommend reading at least fragments of this novel out loud if you can. Um, I think the novel might make more sense if you can do that. Now, my next book also has a child as its protagonist, but the similarities with Zazie in the Metro stop there. I am talking about Arturo's Island, or in Italian, L'Isola di Arturo by Elsa Morante. This novel is from 1957, but I think it has aged really well. Uh, the novel is set on a small island called Procida, which is in the Bay of Naples in southern Italy. But there isn't anything glamorous about this island. So Arturo is a boy whose mother died giving birth to him before the novel begins. He's only a child, or he's rather an only child, who basically raises himself in this decadent, gloomy palace on the island. His father spends most of his time away from Procida and only visits from time to time, very occasionally. That doesn't change even after um, he brings his new wife to the island. Nunziata is her name, and being only 17, she's barely older than Arturo, and a lot closer to him in age than to her husband. Arturo's Island is a coming-of-age story like no other I have read. I struggled a little bit with the style of the novel at first, because I thought it was slightly too painstakingly detailed, but things picked up for me with uh, Nunziata's arrival on the island. Arturo's Island is said before just before World War II, in a place that is isolated from the rest of the world. Its lean cast of characters and the island setting can make the novel feel a bit claustrophobic, despite all the sunshine, but I think that's by design. And pay special attention to the island's penitentiary as you read on, because, well, just pay attention to it and you will know what I mean when you finish the novel. Okay, only two more books to go now. So I guess I did read a lot in September. The last two books I have are contemporary novels, but they are not quite new releases. The first one is Civilizations by the French writer Laurent Binet, which I think first came out in France in only in 2019, uh, but it is also now available in English. So imagine that Christopher Columbus had never returned from his first journey, okay? But, you know, many years before that, the Vikings, would have also made it as far as Cuba and probably further south. So the Spaniards never actually managed to conquer Cuba, Mexico or Peru or anywhere else in that part of the world. A few years after Columbus's failed trip, the Inca Emperor Atahualpa and some of his people land in Lisbon. Now, how do we get from Vikings and Columbus failed trip to that? And what will happen or what would have happened if the Inca had conquered the Spanish Empire and not the other way around. That is what this novel, Civilizations, imagines and tries to explore in fiction. The novel is divided into four parts that are meant to be historical documents. The first part is written in the style of a Norse saga and it talks about the Vikings' forays in what we now call the Americans but never becomes that 
in this parallel history, uh, in the parallel history this novel imagines. Then part two is Christopher Columbus's fictional diary, which is inspired by the real diary he kept on board. After that comes the novel's main section, the longer section, which is about how Atahualpa crossed the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, after a key visit to Cuba, how he conquers the Spanish Empire, and what he does with it. I enjoyed that part the most, but I sometimes felt like Binet, the author, was trying to set the wrongs of the past right, so that part of the novel sometimes felt like a reckoning for the evil Europeans that ransacked the Americas in real life. I just thought it was a bit simplistic maybe at times. Of course, you know, I'm not trying to justify European imperialism or colonialism at all or anything like that. I just don't think feeling, um, you know, I don't like feeling preached to when I read fiction. Anyway, the last part of the novel is then about Cervantes, Miguel de Cervantes, the author of Don Quixote, and imagines how he would have fared in this alternative history. I enjoyed civilizations, I enjoyed the level of detail. At times it felt like I was reading an alternative history version of Wikipedia rather than a novel though, uh, but I had fun with it, I enjoyed it, and if you like the sound of it you might also enjoy reading it too. It is probably the less demanding novel I read in September as well, which is not necessarily a bad thing, although my next book is the novel I enjoyed the most last month. It is also the last one I read, so it is fresh in my mind. I have left the best for last. I bought this copy of My Brilliant Friend by Elena Ferrante a few years ago. Um, I put off reading it for a couple of reasons. The first one is that I am skeptical about hype, and this novel and its sequels are so popular and so critically acclaimed that I thought they just couldn't be as good as people claim somehow. I cannot speak for the other three novels in the series because I have not read them yet, but my brilliant friend is amazing. And the second reason I put off reading this copy is that it is, as you can see, in Italian, and I didn't think my Italian would be uh, good enough uh, to read it, even though I have read one or two books in Italian before. I am just so glad that I finally decided to tackle my brilliant friend. Uh, in Italian because it is one of the most compelling novels I have read in a long time. I became so invested in the main characters early on that I just could not stop reading about them. And I don't know if my Italian is really good or what, but I found reading the novel in the original language such a pleasure. You know, I just cannot imagine reading it in translation, but I'm sure the English translation is fantastic. However, you know, uh, I have linked to the English translation in the description box in case you'd like to buy it. What can I say about my brilliant friend that hasn't already been said by other smarter people than me? It's the story of a friendship between two women, Lila Cerullo and Elena Greco, who is also the narrator. Elena is the narrator. Now, this first novel in the series covers their childhood and adolescence. Uh, they are both from working class backgrounds and grew up in the outskirts of Naples in the 1950s. I was shocked by some of the violence described in the novel, which makes sense, makes perfect sense given the character's background and the setting of the novel, and it is most definitely not gratuitous at all, but I just did not expect it somehow. In this first novel, we began to see, or we begin to see the different paths that the two women's lives are going to take. I know I'll read the three, the next three novels in the series, but I am not in a hurry to do so. I hope that uh, they are as good as my brilliant friend though. And that brings me to the end of this video. I hope you've liked it. Please let me know what you have read in September in the comment section below as usual. I would also love to know if you have read any of the books I talk about in this video. Take care and see you soon. Bye.